I have an email here. I'm going to take a few minutes to answer this and kind of kill two birds with one stone. I'm going to talk about one of the uh, non-dispensational things that they try to come up with. These people that don't believe in rightly dividing the word of truth. They'll come out and they'll say, uh, there's no proof that uh, salvation was by works in the Old Testament. Well, they always say it's, it's always been by grace through faith. Always grace through faith. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. I'm going to prove that today in this study. But I'm going to read you the email here. I'm going to keep the brother's name um, secret because he didn't say whether or not to share it. So um, it says here, um, this was on uh, the 5th of January. I think No. January 1st, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my reply back and things. The 1st of January, 2018. Hey, Brother Brian, I realized that after my conversion to Christ, I need to study doctrines of the faith for myself and lean on the Lord through prayer and the Bible. This is the same for dispensationalism. I have watched your two-part study on it, and I have some genuine questions about it. Obviously, with doctrine, I think it's healthy to look at both arguments and non-dispensationalists. Well, we'll get to that, what they say here. Or what he says here, but uh, as far as looking at both arguments, um, I understand what you're saying, but you got to be careful with that thing. Uh, <clears throat> Romans chapter, I don't have any notes for this you know, study. I don't really need that many because it's a pretty easy thing to answer. Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So be careful about this modern thing of, of you got to hear all sides of the argument and whatever else. Um, I personally believe that you study the truth, what the Holy Spirit will show you plainly from Scripture. And then as you're getting out there and talking to people about that truth, you'll hear the, the other side of the argument, so to speak. Okay. But I think it's very dangerous to listen to a lot of false prophets and things like that. They can really put a lot of questions into your mind and you go, oh, I don't know, I don't know. I think that there are some that are called to do that. I'm in ministry. Uh, the Lord's helped me to get grounded very firmly in different, you know, the, the, the doctrines of Scripture, uh, especially for a Christian today. But, you know, I, I would really warn new believers from listening to false prophets just so you can, quote, get both sides. That's dangerous. All right. Um, you wouldn't say, well, I'm going to listen to what a Satanist has to say against Jesus Christ so I make sure that Jesus Christ is the one true God or something. And that doesn't make much sense. But uh, here's the first thing. <clears throat> Back to the email. It says, Non-dispensationalists say that when the pre-tribulation rapture doesn't happen but the government fakes one, that the dispensationalist will start working their way to heaven and it will prove they were lost. Okay. Um, now let's think about that for a minute. If the government fakes a rapture, the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble, um, why would a Christian fall for that? First of all, who would the government fake leaving? Okay, were they going to hire some actors, some crisis actors, or whatever else? Would, you know, we'd be who are these people that left? It wouldn't make any sense at all. If a bunch of people disappear. Uh, two or three days from now or something like that, I'm not going to go, oh, it was the rapture. I want to say, well, that couldn't have been the rapture. You know, there's no way. Um, kind of weird. But let's just, let's just say it happens and it really shakes us up as, as Bible-believing Christians and, uh, and we're going, oh, man, what are we going to do? Um, what is the system of salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble? Go back to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through 12. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Okay? So what do you do? Don't take the mark, in other words. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. All right? So a Bible believer is going to look and say, okay, it's not, well, the rapture happened and we 
missed it. The stuff that these non-dispensationalists come up with is absurd, but it's not, oh, okay, that happened, so now I'm going to abandon Jesus Christ and just do total complete works or something. Faith in Jesus is still there. The difference is there now there are, there's a commandment, specifically what we just read in verses 9 through 11. We can't take the mark of the beast. Why would they assume uh, uh, these posties, these non-dispensational posties, Catholics is what they are, why would they assume then that all of a sudden we're just going to go total, reject Jesus and just go to total works and, and whatever else? Uh, we understand the Bible a little bit better than that. Faith in Jesus is still there. All right? So, not a very good argument. But... Uh, Continuing with the email, they say that even in the Garden of Eden that Adam's salvation was through blood atonement of the animal the Lord killed. Really? Uh, okay. Um, so he went straight to heaven when he died? This is what we're going to get into in this little study here. We're going to look at uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and chapter 10. We're going to read both chapters and just kind of go through it quickly. Um, that blood of the animals that was sacrificed in the Old Testament, it didn't take away sin. It covered the sin, but it never took it away. So the non-dispensationalist tries to say, well, see, they've, they've always been saved. It's always been by faith, by grace through faith. It's always the same. No, it isn't. We'll talk about that. Um, they also say that Old Testament saints couldn't have been saved by works of the Mosaic Law because the wages of sin is always death and blood always needs to be shed. Uh, I'm not sure if you got that one right. I was wondering if you could please answer these objections to get a more confirmed view on this issue or of this issue. Thanks. Um, I don't know if you're getting what they're trying to say. I, I, they confuse, you know, we, they really confuse you when, when you listen to these people. Uh, it's amazing to me how the devils within them can just twist the scriptures. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, let's see if I can get this again. They also say that Old Testament saints couldn't have been saved by works of the Mosaic Law because the wages of sin is always death and blood always needs to be shed. Well, they were shedding blood. It was just the blood of animals. I, I'm not sure if you're getting that one right from their position there. But uh, let's let's go over this thing of... Because um, I know the non-dispensational argument, especially among the Bathlicks, they'll, they'll try to say um, that, you know, they believed in Jesus. They had faith in Jesus. You know, in the Old Testament, they have faith in Jesus, you know, and you say, prove it. Abraham was justified by faith. The Bible plainly says it. Uh, okay, they're brilliant. Let me, let me just try to speak slowly so you can get it, all right? Abraham was before the giving of the law, okay? Uh, he was dead before Exodus was written, all right? You understand? And uh, Leviticus wasn't around in Abraham's day. They don't quite get some of that stuff. But let's see here. What was the system of salvation in the Old Testament? It was always, you know, and another one of the little favorite things I'll say, they got saved by looking forward to the cross. Now we get saved by looking back to the cross. Uh, then why was it that the disciples of Jesus kept saying, what? Well, you know, he, Jesus is telling them what kind of death they're dying, and they're going, you know, Peter at one point, he says, be it far from me. You know, no, you know. Even after Jesus dies, comes up from the dead, they're still walking around going, I don't know what happened. I, I, don't, I don't get it, you know. <laughs> no, they were not saved by looking forward to the cross. That's nutty nonsense. No scripture at all for that. But let's, let's continue here. Hebrews chapter 9. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of div divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tab tables of the covenant and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, 
which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. And that's the same thing we have today. Why were they doing that? Let's continue. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Uh-oh. While as the first tabernacle was yet standing, it was not yet made manifest? Well, they were saved the same way, weren't they? See the problem? Verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Wait a second. Their sins weren't taken away in the Old Testament? That's right. The animals that they were sacrificing and all the divine service things and all the come and you're to be unclean until the evening and the priest is supposed to sacrifice the animal and take a drop of the blood, put it on your ear and you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to do that, all these other things. It couldn't make them perfect. It couldn't take their sins away. Covered it, but it didn't take it away. Their salvation was not the same thing as what we have today. Not even close. Verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Oh, it's sad, isn't it? You know, no, not a building there, not some holy tabernacle and things. Yeah. Verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Okay, um, all the nice stuff that they were doing there in the Old Testament, it didn't take that sin away. Jesus Christ had to shed his blood. Acts chapter 20 verse 28 says about God hath purchased with his own blood. It was God's blood. Okay? <laughs> verse 15. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15 through 17. So when did the Old Testament end and the New Testament begin? And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Look at this. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. When did the New Testament begin? It's in Matthew chapter 1. No, read your Bible with the death of the testator. Who's the testator? Jesus Christ. Um, is Matthew chapter 24 in the Old or the New Testament? It's in a collection of books called the New Testament, but doctrinally speaking, it's in the Old Testament. Why was it that Mary had to go offer two turtle doves when Jesus was born? Did you offer two turtle doves? or a lamb, or go and... I mean, where's the, where's the sanctuary that we're supposed to go to and offer an animal for sacrifice? It's not there. Why? We're saved by grace through faith today. Well, they were saved the same way. Then why were they doing these other things? You see? It's always an element of God's grace there. Understand. It doesn't matter which dispensation that you're in. There's always an, an element of God's grace. But faith is not going to be there in every single dispensation. You say, oh, that, that sounds heretical. Well, that's probably because you don't really understand the Bible that well. In the Millennial Kingdom, let me ask you, ask you a question. Are people saved by faith in the Millennial Kingdom? How can they be? Jesus Christ is physically on the earth. You can't have faith in something that you can see. Or I should say, you don't need faith when you can see something plainly. People, they just don't want to deal with that, though. The non-dispensationalists. Verse 18, Hebrews 9, verse 18. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, 
he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkling both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. Uh, when's the last time you did that as a Christian? So, well, we don't have to do it anymore. Oh, then, you, you know, maybe salvation's different now. Just maybe. Verse 22, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. All that stuff back there in the Old Testament was just symbol uh, uh, there symbolically to show what goes on in heaven. All right? But Jesus Christ came and he fulfilled all that stuff, so that stuff's not necessary anymore. All right? It's just, it's, it's really not that hard to get, unless you're trying to specifically force the Bible into your system of interpretation, like non dispensationalists do, and uh, resting the scriptures because they don't understand it because they're lost. Uh, verse 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the, ho the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation." Uh, chapter 10, verse 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Lining up with what we read earlier there. The sacrifices that were, they were doing in the Old Testament was a perpetual thing. You couldn't just come and say, I, you know, there's the lamb, you can sacrifice it, and they put it on the altar and all the other stuff, and, and now, good, I'm, I'm good for the rest of my life. No, they had to come back and keep doing it over and over and over again. It's not true for a Christian. The Lord saves you one time, and that's it. You don't have to get re-saved and re-saved and re-saved. You sin and you're out, and you've got to get the sacrifice again and things. Nope, but that's what they had in the Old Testament. Verse 2, For then would they not have ceased to be offered? because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Why would it say that there if uh, they were you know, saved the same way in the Old Testament as we are in the New Testament? It's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Why would it say that if that's not what they were doing? You say, well, they, they, they sacrificed, you know, Adam had the sacrifice of the lamb there in the Garden of Eden, so he was saved. Um, okay, then uh, why would Jesus Christ come to the earth and go through the death that he went through? I mean, if they're saved the same way in the Old Testament, they're sacrificing animals. Not one of them had faith in Jesus Christ. They didn't even know the name of Jesus Christ. And even if they had faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus did, Christ didn't die on the cross yet. This is basic stuff, right? If you're genuinely saved, it's just going to be like, well, yeah, obviously. How could anybody be saved by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, the gospel that we have now. How could they be saved by that in the Old Testament before Jesus Christ showed up? I mean, duh, with a capital D, you know. These people are dense. And I've written back and forth with them. That's what they, they'll, they'll, you know, try to skirt around the issue or they'll try to play little word games with you and stuff. It's ridiculous. Verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and an offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldst not, neither hadst 
pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He take, taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. And again, you know, these, these non-dispensationalists crack me up. They'll go, they'll go there, there is a proper division in Scripture. It's Old Testament, New Testament. Amen. Amen. Uh, we don't get the difference between those two. You know, they're trying to cover up for the seven different dispensations there. They, they don't understand. You know, I mean, the Garden of Eden, and then before the giving of the law, under the law, law and the prophets are until John, since that time the kingdom of heaven is preached. Okay, Jesus dies on the cross. You have what many call the church age, the body of Christ, the time that the body of Christ is on earth. Right, Salvation is by grace through faith. And then you have the time of Jacob's trouble. And then you have the millennial kingdom. Then eternity, okay, goes into eternity. But that's when most dispensationalists will end it. Right there, seven dispensations. It's really not that difficult. But they, oh, it's so hard. It's so convoluted and everything. No, it isn't. It's not that hard. But... Let's just go with their thing, you know, Old Testament, New Testament. Okay, is there a difference between the two? Are they getting saved differently? No, no, they're not getting saved differently. It's the same salvation. They had eternal security the whole time, and it's by grace through faith the whole time. I have no idea what they're talking about. I mean, verse 9, He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Why? Why? <laughs> They're getting saved the same way in the Old Testament. Why would he take away the first and establish the second? Makes no sense at all. Adam was saved, you know, and stuff. And he went, you know, right to heaven apparently when he died because, you know, he got saved by the blood of the Lamb back there and, you know, after the fall in the Garden of Eden and things. And, and so he saved and there you go. Well, then Jesus sure wasted his time when he came to the earth. You see the, the mess people get into? Verse 10. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. By the, which will we, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Here's a good one to nail Catholics in their transubstantiation, the Eucharist sacrifice thing. Once for all. Again, they try to get people back under this thing of perpetual sacrificing and things because the Roman Catholicism teaches that the Old Testament priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, has now been translated by Jesus Christ into his New Testament priesthood of a bunch of celibate, child-molesting, pedophile priests. You know, I mean, it's right there. You can, why can't you see it? You know, it's crazy. Uh, nonsense, in other words. Verse 11, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. It's talking about the Old Testament. But salvation is the same. Verse 12, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. And a lot of the new versions will say are being sanctified because they have to keep the works going, you see. So, yeah. But let's keep reading here. I want to I go over a couple more things. Here. I don't know if I'm going to read the whole way to the end of the chapter because I think we've pretty much already proved the point of the, you know, salvation being works in the Old Testament. Uh, they didn't have faith in Jesus because Jesus hadn't even come to the earth yet. So, I mean, it's just absurd. I mean, you know, it, it's literally to the point right now in the body of Christ that you have these heretics come along and, and arguing with Christians and saying, I can prove to you as a matter of fact that your Bible is not black. You know, for years and years and years, the first guy that came out and said it was John Nelson Darby. He said Bibles are black, and people have been believing it for years now. It's all been a huge conspiracy. And you get Christians are so gullible, and they go, Really? I always thought it was black. Maybe I'm wrong. I need to look at both sides of the thing. You know, brethren, <laughs> I mean, you know, salvation is the same in the Old Testament as, in, as it is in the New Testament. Then why did Jesus Christ come to the earth? You know, if they're getting saved by the blood of the Lamb back in the Old Testament, for goodness sake, Lord, stay in heaven. Don't come down here and have to die a terrible death. You know, it just, don't be so gullible, people. You know, I'm not ripping on you, brother, that, that wrote this email here. I'm just saying, you know, people in general. But let's continue. Verse 15. 
whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I re remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Praise the Lord for the New Testament, in other words. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. The Old Testament. I serve a dead lamb, He's not in the world today. I know that He is dead and eaten by the Levitical priesthoods over in the way. <laughs> it's not the same thing, okay? Crazy. By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us, through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assemblies, assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Now, I teach and preach that the book of Hebrews is uh, written to a particular group. Oh, oh, I can't think of what the name was. Um, let's see. Uh, Hebrews. But you say, well, no, Brother Brian, that's that's incorrect. You see, because Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says, there's neither Jew nor Gentile or no, Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. So why would you say a Hebrew, Hebrew Christian? No, you're a Christian, you see. Well, then why write a book called To the Hebrews and James to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad greeting? Why would you do that? Why are the 12 tribes in the Pauline epistles? They're not there. He does talk about that he's of the tribe of Benjamin, I believe it is, you know, Paul. But uh, what's going on? Well, the time of Jacob's trouble, you know, Jacob being Israel is coming in the future. And these non-dispensationalists, they'll rail and scream about how wicked Israel is. And you say, what's the time period coming for? The purification of the church. Huh? <laughs> so God is completely done with the Jews, and now he's just mad at the church, and he's going to put the church through his judgment. What about the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us from all sin? What about that? Oh, no, we got to be purified yet. Almost sounds a little bit Catholic, doesn't it? Oh, that's right, the Catholics actually do believe in the final purification of Christ's church. Hmm. But, uh, weird. But, you know, the Jews are wicked, the Jews are evil, and everything else. Um, yeah, they are. Well, God's all done with them. No, no. Uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, it's coming. For the Jews. You understand? That's why they always have to change the time of Jacob's trouble or Daniel's 70th week. They have to change it to the Great Tribulation. It's incredible. This book here is written to the Jews. And they're going to be shown this in that time of Jacob's trouble after the church is gone after the church leaves and then the Antichrist is revealed. You know, and again, I've proved that thing in many, many, many studies. And now Moses and Elijah show up and they start to preach. I mean, why did Moses and Elijah, you know, who cares if they show up to for Christians? What are they going to convince us of? doesn't mean anything. But to an Orthodox Jew, oh boy, Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets, and these two guys show up and they're preaching to them out of the New Testament. The Jews require a sign. Signs and wonders in the heavens, you know, during the time of Jacob's trouble. Book of Revelation, sign after sign after sign after sign. Who's it to? It's to the Jews, you see. The Hebrews. Not that difficult if you're saved. If you're not saved, like a lot of the people that are non-dispensational, you know, I, I mean, some of them might just be brand new saved and they fall for some of the non-dispensational lying type of stuff. And so I don't say that all non-dispensationalists are lost, but the ones that know the issue, yeah, they're definitely lost. There's no question about that. 
Uh, you can't get that messed up as a Christian with the Holy Spirit of God inside you. He comes and he leads into all truth. So, but look at verse 26 and 27. All right. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. What's the fiery indignation? Well, there's an awful lot of fire in the time of Jacob's trouble. And uh, what do we read in Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, about those that take the mark, worship the beast in his image? They go to hell, and they burn forever and ever. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day, or nor, day nor night. That's the fiery indig indignation. So in that time period, it's coming, the time of Jacob's trouble, after the church, after the body of Christ has been removed, now the Jews that are in that time period, with God's judgment and wrath coming upon them because they've rejected their Messiah for almost 2,000 years. And in that time period, if they take the mark of the beast, they're going to go to hell. So there's an element of works. Faith is still there. We saw that in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Faith is still there, yes. But now there's an element of works that's there. That's very, very important to get. So, I'm not going to read the rest of the verses there of Hebrews chapter 10 because I think I've proved my point. They were not saved in the Old Testament by faith in Jesus Christ or, well, they had faith in things. Abraham's faith is before the giving of the law. That's when the Bible talks about Abraham was justified by faith. And his faith was in God providing a lamb for the sacrifice. You know, God will provide himself a lamb for the sacrifice. Uh, he didn't know. If you went to Abraham and said, uh, do you put your faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? He'd go, the what? You know, he didn't have faith in Jesus. He had faith in God, you see. And God's going to take care of, in, in, of the situation there. He's going to have to kill his own son. God's doing things in type to show something that's going to happen later. And, you know, they'll take Abraham, where it says that he's justified by faith, and they say all Old Testament saints are justified by faith because it names one man. Dishonest. People are liars. So, were saints uh, saved in the Old Testament uh, the same way we are now? No. I think that should be pretty clear. Uh, please don't fall for this non-dispensational stuff. And quite frankly, if uh, you need to be open to the Lord's leading in this thing, and if you start to listen to somebody and the Lord starts prompting you saying, no, you need to stop listening to them, then stop listening to them. Our text over in Romans chapter 16 said that we're to mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Not Listen to them. Let them have their time to talk and things like this. Over in, in uh, Galatians, uh, Paul's talking about these, you know, the, the Jews that were trying to get Gentiles back under the, you know, the law, the Torah, and whatever. And uh, he says, you know, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. He just, uh, just be quiet, get out. That's the way it should be. I mean, you know, somebody comes along and they say, let's let's talk about pornography. And to really talk about pornography, I think it's important that you look at pornography. Because otherwise, how can you have a well-rounded uh, idea of what it really is and how it works? No, no. Abstain from all appearance of evil. No. Um, hey, I think that maybe before you do a talk on uh, alcohol and drunkenness, I think maybe you should get drunk first. You see what I'm saying? Let's, let's talk about dispensationalism and let's study dispensationalism. And the Lord shows me, yeah, that's really good. That's really true. It lines up with the scriptures. But now let's go listen to somebody that denies the clear teachings of scripture. I don't agree with that. And all it does is just shake up your faith. It puts questions in your mind. You go, I don't know. I don't know. Understand something about false prophets. The Bible says God is not the author of confusion. Well, then by default, who would be? Satan. Satan is the author of confusion. And his ministers will come in and they will confuse you 
and mess your mind all up in things. They'll put, they'll put doubts and, and things in your mind. And unless you really, 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 really know how to spot these people, it'll just, it'll just mess your head up, you know? And I mean, there are times I'll listen to some of these false prophets and I just, I just go, okay, I, I need to just, I just, I just stop it. And I, I've seen enough. I don't need to know any more than that. I just, it's like I can feel that confusion, that spirit of confusion coming over, over my mind. And I'm going, because, you know, it starts out and I'm going, what? I never heard that. That doesn't even make any sense. I can, I can refute that with this point and this point and that verse and that, okay, what, oh no, what are they saying now? Oh, huh? Well, that's ridiculous. That that contradicts this scripture, and that's oh, what are they saying now? And before long, it's just like they're heaping lies upon lies upon lies upon lies, and pretty soon it starts to bog you down, and you just go, uh, and it's it's not right to listen to that stuff. I do some of it simply because I'm trying to show people how to debunk a lot of this stuff, but uh, you got to be real careful, especially if you're a new believer. I don't recommend it. So. Uh, that's going to be it for this uh, study. Uh, yes, they were saved in the Old Testament. Their sins were covered. Um, that's why they went to Abraham's bosom. The Bible talks about that. They went down on the earth there, and they were basically sleeping, waiting for the perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ, to come. Again, I've talked about that in other studies. I can't do a big study on that right now. Um, but Jesus Christ dies on the cross, he goes down, and the Bible says he leads captivity captive. He takes them out. Old Testament saints, come with me. The perfect blood has been shed now. You can go into the holiest of, of holies there. You can go into heaven. Before they couldn't do that, because all they had was the impure blood of animals to cover their sins. But it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sins. Just as clear as that.